Hello, hello, hello. I see people joining, welcome. If you could pop in the chat and let us know what school you're representing, where you're from, drop your city, your school name, would love to know who's joining us this evening. Welcome everybody, lots of people joining. Anosa, is the chat open? Perfect. Oh, I see our first person, Nehemiah Lawrence from Alabama State University. That's where Victoria is, I think, right now. We see Bethune Cookman. UNCF is in the building. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We'll give it one more minute and then we'll get started. Um, I want to make sure that our facilitator has all the time that she needs to um, talk to you all this evening. I feel like next time we should have some like music to jam to. We're learning, we're learning. Okay. Welcome everybody. Happy Black History Month. Um, this is our first unapologetically free workshop. Unapologetically Free is an initiative brought to you by UNCF, Thurgood Marshall Fund, and the STE Fund. Um, I think we're supposed to have some slides come up in just a second. Perfect. Um, this wonderful initiative that's brought to you by all of these amazing partners will consist of a study that some of you may be engaged in right now. Some of you will find out about it a little bit later. Um, it also will feature conferences for faculty, staff, and students, and a series of workshops. Um, today's workshop is called Racial Healing, Creating Space for Wellness Throughout College. This workshop will be recorded and made available to you online after this session. Um, feel free to check out the website unapologetically-free.org or the Steve Funds website where you can find more information about this work. Um, while participants are muted on this workshop, feel free to use the Q&A feature as well as the chat feature to ask any questions or drop any comments. Snaps are welcome too. Um, throughout this session, um, we're going to have Dr. Bati lead us, but first, I guess I need to tell you who I am. Um, my name is Rajay Branch. I am the Director of Families and Special Projects at the Steve Fund, where I get to work with some pretty amazing people um, to bring some content to you. Uh, the Steve Fund focuses on supporting the mental health and emotional well-being for young people of color. We do this through a series of programs, um, working with nonprofit partners, colleges, institutions, businesses, the like, um, really to care about the mental health of our young people. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing our facilitator, uh, affectionately known as Botsi, but Botsi Rai uh, Vunzaboea is our facilitator for today. She is a counseling psychologist with a small private practice in the suburbs of Philly. She is currently working with the Steve Fund as um, one of our beloved uh, mental health consultants. She's also serving as director of integrated care initiatives at the University of Pennsylvania. She's a proud graduate of Alabama A&M, where she was a member of the women's tennis team. She earned her PhD in counseling psychology from Auburn University. Her clinical interests include exploring issues related to minority health, body image concerns, sexual trauma, racial and ethnic identity development, and suicide prevention. She is strongly committed to promoting and exploring how issues of equity and inclusion are incorporated in all aspects of her practice. She currently holds leadership positions with the American Psychological Association Society for Counseling Psychologists, the Society for the Psychology of Black Women, and with the Association for University College Counseling Center Outreach. So without further ado, Dr. Batsi, I'm turning it over to you. Okay, thank you so much, Rajay. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, so as Rajay shared, uh, I went to Alabama A&M, so uh, HBCUs have a special place in my heart. 
Um, partly because I was able to have an education because of an HBCU. Uh, so if it was not for my education at Alabama a and I probably would not have gone on to Auburn or to have any of the positions that I have. But maybe more importantly for me to mention, especially for my husband, I met him there many years ago. So uh, we're an HBCU household. So that always feels really, really exciting to be able to, to be with everybody again um, within this setting. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, wanting to, to sort of ground us a little bit in what our discussion will be today. So first, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about just uh, some of the awareness that goes into common uh, race-related stressors. Um, so many of these things may not be uh, new to you, but hopefully it'll just give you some language to kind of think about um, how these things may be impacting you in a day-to-day -day basis. We are going to identify some skills and resources for coping. So hopefully um, you'll leave with some tools to kind of think about how you um, may navigate your world a little bit differently based on how you've been feeling. And of course, just talking more and more about just the mental health impact. Um, as was mentioned earlier, I'm a counseling psychologist. So one of the things that's so important is just not only thinking about what the impact is, but continuing to think about what healing may look like, as opposed to just thinking about how to cope or get through the day. So um, let's get started. So the first part is just um, really reflecting a little bit on the consciousness raising process. So for those of you who may not be familiar, it's just this activity of seeking um, to make sure that we're all aware of some of the personal, social, and political issues that may be affecting us on a day-to-day -day basis. So this is the part of the presentation where I'm gonna sort of lay a little bit of the foundation of some of the ideas and concepts that we may take into account as we're thinking about race-related stress. And then of course, we're gonna jump into the impact on student well-being, and then uh, talk a little bit about coping and healing. So I wanna start a little bit with just kind of grounding us with this idea of how as individuals, we often interact with our environment, right? So there is this uh, interaction effect between us as individuals, and it's a little bit of a transactional relationship, right? So we think about our relationship as an individual, we think about all the different institutions that we may interact with, right? This could be, you know, any schools we've attended, any uh, HBCUs that we attend, uh, anything in your community. So if you're part of a religious community or, um, you know, a social community, right? So if we think about fraternities, athletics, all of those things. Um, but then of course, even if you think about your family unit, right? Um, I know that sometimes we can identify with certain regions within the US or maybe even internationally. Um, and then of course, thinking a little bit about um, the impact of public policies, right? So we know there's so much about um, policy that affects our well-being, right? So there's often this interaction between us and our environment on all of these different levels, but then also thinking about the historical context. And of course, as we're having this conversation during Black History Month, um, you know, it just continues to highlight that we can't minimize the impact that history has in how we function and how we feel. And of course, in the safety that may or may not be present in our environment. So a big piece of talking about our environment is uh, this idea of structural uh, racism, right? So again, it's this blind interaction between institutions, policies, and practices that can create barriers, right, to opportunities and of course, uh, racial disparities. Um, these things can happen on a conscious and unconscious uh, level in terms of the racism that may take place. And of course, it continues to exist in our society, right? But when we think about structural racism, it can really feed on the unconscious. So that's why even though maybe for some of us, it can feel pretty obvious that structural racism is an issue. Um, for some, it may feel like it's something that we have to debate because there is this aspect of it being unconscious, even though for many of us, we know that it's not really a debate, right? We understand the impact that structural racism has and the barriers that may take place, right? So even if we think about the fact that part of why HBCUs exist is because there was structural racism and continues to be, right? We sort of needed that space and needed um, uh, avenues where uh, education was completely focused on uh, black folks and really thinking about what resources and what needs were specific um, to black folks, not just in the past, but obviously now as well. So another piece of us thinking a little bit about this um, idea of the impact of different levels of racism is also talking a little bit about microaggressions theory, right? Um, so these are brief 
commonplace. It could be verbal, behavioral, or environmental. So again, seeing some pieces of that structural racism. And of course, um, many of these microaggressions tend to be hostile. They tend to be negative slights, right? And then any sort of insult towards marginalized folks. And this could be folks of color, women, LGBTQ folks, uh, poor folks, people with disabilities, right? So it's not just um, based on any one aspect of identity. It could be targeting a lot of different groups of people, right? And then um, again, these events can be intentional or unintentional. So most of the times when we talk about microaggressions, um, it doesn't matter what your intent was, right? The focus is more on the impact. And we know that it's the impact that can actually impact, uh, you know, affect our mental health, right? So most of the time, sometimes people will say, well, I didn't mean to do that. And of course it's important, right? Intention is um, something that we wanna pay attention to, but at the same time, it kind of doesn't matter because the impact tends to be the same on the person that's targeted by that microaggression. We also know that most of the times when people do commit microaggressions, they're often unaware, right? So um, an example of that could be someone trying to pay you a compliment and they might say, oh, um, you're really articulate, right? Um, even though, you know, why wouldn't you be, right? Or uh, sometimes as uh, somebody that, um, you know, is African and was born there, people will say, oh, you speak really good English, right? But of course it may seem like a compliment, but to some degree, why wouldn't I, right? And then even if we just even examine the idea of like what good English is, right? So even just thinking a little bit about that, those are some examples of um, how microaggressions can continue to, to sort of permeate even if they're uh, meant to be compliments or meant to be something um, that's positive. But of course, even if it's something that's unconscious, we still have to be held um, accountable to sort of thinking a little bit more about those things. So I'm gonna focus a little bit more on uh, racial identity today. But I also think it's important that we're talking about how uh, our racial identity intersects with other aspects of identity. So uh, this is just a brief uh, diagram of what's called the addressing model by Pamela Hayes. And essentially just talks a little bit about the unique experiences based on all of our different identities. And then of course, how these identities um, may intersect with other aspects of our identity. So for example, um, if you identify as a black uh, queer woman, your experience may be really different. Um, maybe if you have an identity as a black male who's Muslim, that may look different than somebody else who has another identity as a black person, but intersects with other aspects, right? So even if we're thinking about um, any sort of developmental or acquired disabilities, um, your age and sort of the generational impact, um, there's certain things that you may experience based on sort of the stage in life that you're in, right? So in some ways it helps to add nuance to this idea uh, when we often talk about um, the idea that Black people are not a monolith, right? This model sort of helps us to really sort of start to uh, dissect how we're each different based on our personal experiences and our, and our personal identities, right? So again, may not talk too much about some of these identities, but even as I'm talking about race-based stress or any of those things, just think about what that might mean to you based on the various aspects of your identity, right? What aspects of marginalization or microaggressions or trauma do you experience based on the different aspects of your identity and how they impact you on a on a day to day basis? All right, so focusing a little bit more on racial identity, right? So um, a lot of the work around racial identity uh, was done by um, many wonderful um, scholars, but I'm going to sort of talk a little bit more about the work of Dr. Janet Helms, who is a counseling psychologist as well. And um, I remember even just in grad school learning about her and just feeling so inspired by the work. And obviously there's so much work that's been done since I was in grad school. So it's also just really exciting to, to continue to sort of think about how this is evolving and our understanding and nuances. And of course, as times are changing, how that can look different for, for each of us um, based on the things that are happening around us. So when we think about racial identity, it describes how we think about our own racial group, right? As folks of color, as black folks, but also how we think about ourselves as members of that group, right? So it's not just how I see myself as a black woman, but also how I identify with other black people, right? Um, and then of course, how I might identify with people who are not black and specifically white folks, right? So that's really what I, racial identity um, is focused on. And we know that race is a political variable. We know that it may determine um, the amount of power somebody has within society, but also just any struggles that may um, they may encounter, right? 
and of course the different contexts in which a person is navigating uh, some of those power dynamics or some of those political variables. Um, it's also um, something that we continue to sort of think about the nuances of what the context may may hold as somebody's navigating their different aspects of their racial identity. So of course, um, you know how you may interact with your racial identity as somebody that attends an HBCU may look different than a black person who may be attending a PWI, right? Or uh, navigating other spaces um, that may either feel, you know, affirming and welcoming versus those that may not. And then, you know, when we think about all of the different aspects of our racial identity, it's really around us, right? So we see how we're portrayed whether it's in you know, um, ads online, you know, movie characters, um, any sort of interactions you're having with people. And again, thinking about how the environment is either validating and affirming your identity or at times sort of leading you to question your identity. One of the things we know about students, um, especially in this time of your life is like, you're trying to figure out who am I, right? And sometimes looking for some mirroring or a validation of who you are, right? And that's one of the things that I felt like was really, really amazing for me to attend an HBCU as an international student is I felt like I got so much wonderful affirmation for who I was as a Black person. And also just that um, a deeper understanding of what that meant to be a Black person within the US, right? So there's so much that can be um, shared with us, whether it's on a conscious level or unconscious level in terms of just who we are and, um, how we sort of organize our world and who we are within that world, okay? So, you know, one of the things that's, that's cool but can also be really challenging is that um, we can think about our race in conflicting ways, right? It's something that continues to evolve over time. So it can feel both confusing, disorienting, where at times maybe you feel a lot of pride and excitement and, you know, comfort within the different spaces you're in, but then sometimes it can also be, you know, confusing, right? Um, especially as you're encountering some of the stressors that can come with navigating different environments and especially when they're not as affirming. So I'm gonna share some of the race related definitions that, you know, can sort of add to some of the difficulty that comes uh, with navigating spaces as a black person, okay? So the first one is just thinking a little bit about racial stress. And this is stress that comes specifically from uh, the effects of racism, right? And perceived discrimination. So these are some of the day-to-day -day experiences that somebody may have that can just continue to wear on you over time, right? So this could be sometimes maybe uh, being in an environment where there's a racially insensitive joke and um, you know somebody may be misnaming you um, or just kind of really treating you in a way that sort of adds a little bit of added stress to your day-to-day -day functioning, right? And of course, as you can see there, it can be chronic, it can be comprehensive, and that can continue to, to have impact on you, right? And then when we think about racial battle fatigue, this is talking a little bit more about the energy that's lost, right? From the day-to-day -day experience of um, having all of these different stressors. Um, it sort of talks a little bit about the physiological strain. So physically, how are all of these stressors impact you? But it also talks about the psychological strain, right? Because we know that it's not just a manifestation of um, how you might feel emotionally. We know that some of those things can continue to also impact you on a physiological level. And then of course, all of the energy that goes sometimes to deciphering you know, racial microaggressions, or even just when you think about trying to consult with friends or family about any sort of racism that you're experiencing, right? We know that takes a lot of energy and it can be pretty draining, right? And then especially when you're in a workplace setting, or in an academic setting, sometimes because the, there's a power differential, there's added stress that can come from that, right? Or even when we think about the power differential that may exist um, in a law enforcement situation or other situations where you can tell that there's a power differential within your interaction with uh, the other person. And then the third part is talking a little bit about racial trauma, right? So this is the consequence of emotional pain that uh, many folks of color may experience, right? And again, it's prolonged, it's chronic, it's harmful, right? When we're thinking a little bit about how that can wear with you, wear on you over time. So when we think about racial trauma, we know that it can occur and then reoccur, which can be uh, difficult to navigate. Because when we think about um, post-traumatic stress disorder in general, we know that it involves trying to find a sense of safety. It involves reminding the person that they're no longer at risk of being harmed. And it's about helping somebody restore their sense of control. Um, and sort of this idea of confidence within the world. 
But what can be difficult about racial trauma is um, it can be chronic and unrelenting. And that's what can continue to, to impact you in a negative and significant way is that it's hard to restore a sense of safety because maybe even when you're getting close to that, maybe something else happens that feels like it's, it's traumatizing um, and has an effect on your general well-being. So it's almost like this process of trying to continuously recover from something that's happening to you day to day, which can be uh, really challenging. And then last but not least, we know that there's also impact that comes from vicarious trauma, right? And this is hearing or witnessing or seeing things uh, that are racially traumatic, right? And it doesn't have to be somebody that you know, it can be a stranger um, or just anyone in your environment who's just hearing the story, right? So of course, there are um, many examples that we can think about this, but the most recent one is uh, thinking about Tyree Nichols's murder, right? Uh, for any folks that saw any of the videos, heard the story, right? You can experience vicarious trauma from that and just continuing to sort of re-experience that in your mind in some way. And of course, that can also um, have negative impact on your mental health and well-being. So um, I feel like I would not be a good counseling psychologist if I did not talk about just the impact of emotions and feelings, um, because this is a lot of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis is just really thinking about how do our emotions and feelings impact how we're navigating our world? And then what information do we get from our feelings uh, that help to, to sort of determine what actions we need to take in order to take care of ourselves, right? So when we're thinking about um, emotions, these are sort of these natural instinctive state of mind, um, they're multifaceted. Um, and in a lot of ways, we can sort of think about how we gather information about emotions, right? It can be a physical experience. It can be very subjective, right? So we can witness the same thing or feel the same, uh, see the same event, but have very different emotional reactions, right? So even if you think within your family, if you have any siblings, um, you can have very different experiences of what it was like growing up in your home, right? So it's not that we can all always come to a consensus about our emotions. It just really depends on our own personal experiences and how we're taking in information. We also know that emotions can manifest um, in terms of our facial, uh, facial expressions as well as our physiological reactions, right? So even when you think about moments where maybe you feel anxious, you may feel tightness in your shoulders, maybe in your back, feeling some of that tension. Um, and there's just different aspects that, you know, emotions, and of course the same is true if you're experiencing positive emotions as well um, and feeling excitement and all of those, you can feel yourself sort of relax and really soak in the moment. Um, so when we think a little bit about this idea of the difference between feelings and emotions is that uh, most of the times we experience our feelings uh, on a more conscious level, whereas our emotions uh, can manifest either consciously or uh, subconsciously. And of course, again, in therapy, part of what you're trying to do is kind of figure out some of the underlying emotions, because once you sort of um, can see them, understand them, then it helps you to understand how it's impacting your day-to-day -day functioning, right? So even when we think about some of the uh, race-based stress, it's important that we're understanding them, not just the feelings in the moment, but sort of the underlying emotions and how they could be affecting um, our day-to-day -day functioning. Because if we're not aware of them, then it's hard for us to fully tend to them and make sure that we're restoring a sense of safety and calm for ourselves, right? And I love this uh, Maya Angelou quote, and I think it's um, super accurate. I think sometimes I'll have this emotion of like feeling a, a sense of closeness to somebody. And I can't really quite pinpoint why that is or if they said something to me that felt meaningful. But I kind of know that feeling, right? You sort of have a sense of feeling, you know, connection or sometimes maybe a sense of disconnection from somebody and maybe you don't exactly remember, you know, the event that led to you uh, either liking them or not liking them. But usually we know how people make us feel. And that's something that again, can, can allow us to really connect to other people. So one of my favorite quotes there when I um, sort of think about emotions and the impact they have from us. So I'm not gonna go too much into this, even though this is again, stuff that I really enjoy talking about in therapy, which is, you know, how do we sometimes get to a place where we're disconnected from our own emotions, right? So sometimes we can grow up in environments that have implicit or explicit messages around how we should engage emotionally with other people. So it could be cultural messages. So even just thinking about your own cultural context, what are some of the messages that you've gotten about emotions, right? Do you have permission to feel certain emotions versus others? Um, we know about all the different stereotypes around emotions, right? Uh, I'll try not to repeat a lot of them because I think they're harmful in a lot of ways. Um, but an example is even just um, the idea of like how anger sometimes is tied to 
to Black folks, right? Um, and how that can be seen as a negative thing. Or sometimes this portrayal of in invincibility or dehumanization, right? And sort of thinking about some of those emotions that can lead to then us feeling disconnected. So, you know, as a, a Black woman, what can it feel like for me to feel angry and then not express that anger or feel a lot of anxiety about even uh, articulating that I feel angry in that moment because I may be worried about what the ramifications of that perception might be, even though other people may also have felt angry at that moment. But what does it mean when I'm the one expressing that anger, right? What impact does that have? And then of course, what does it mean to me to feel like some of my emotions are restricted, right? There are only certain emotions that I can feel in certain settings. And of course, again, over time, that can also have um, a wearing effect on us, right? So sometimes it can feel a little bit safer to be perceived as unemotional, right? Or a little bit distant. But we also know that sometimes then that affects our ability to connect with others, right? So again, thinking about all of these different messages that we may get from family, maybe academic institutions, uh, work communities, right? And then even when we think about how we may adapt based on the environment that we're in. So maybe when you're home with your family, you're portraying different emotions and expressing yourself differently, but maybe in other settings, then you know it's a little bit more muted or um, restricted in some way. All right, so I'm gonna pause for a second um, from talking at you and we're gonna pull up a poll. So the question is, in the past month, what emotions have you experienced as it relates to race-related stressors? So we're gonna pull up the, the poll quickly. We're gonna open it for about a minute. Uh, feel free to respond and let's see uh, for everybody in the audience what emotions have come up for you in the last month when we think about race-related stressors. All right, we're seeing some great responses here. All right, I'm seeing 19 people have responded, so we'll wait a little longer, see if we get everybody in there. All right, awesome. I think we're close to 30, so we'll give it maybe five more seconds and see if, all right. So, we have ended the poll. All right. So uh, as you all can see, the most common emotion that folks have felt is sadness, all right, uh, followed by anxiety, right? So if you feel comfortable in the chat, you can even uh, write any other emotions maybe that we didn't mention or anything else that comes to mind in terms of um, emotions that you've had. We see that about 30% of people felt angry, right? And I feel like I can think of so many things that have happened in the last month that I can imagine um, may have led to people feeling all of these things. Um, and then you see loneliness and isolation is in there as well. About 23% felt hopeful, right? Because sometimes we can have race-related stress, but also maybe encounter some healing, some support that can allow us to feel a sense of hope. Uh, maybe if you have any religious practice, sometimes that can also help to instill hope that maybe things can continue to change and evolve. And then of course, last but not least, uh, folks have also felt a degree of grief, okay? All right, so thank you all so much for filling that poll. We're gonna have a couple more polls as, as we go here. So let's see, I'm just gonna go ahead and close that. All right, so we're gonna transition a little bit to talking about race-related stress, specifically as it impacts uh, student wellness, right? And um, I've been fortunate that in my work with the Steve Fund, as well as at Penn, I get to have a lot of these conversations on a day-to-day -day basis and sort of think a little bit about um, what support looks like for, for students specifically. So one of the things that we try to pay attention to when we think about the impact of uh, race-based stress is just this idea of internalized racism. So again, when we think about uh, what students may be experiencing as they're at an academic institution, is they're trying to figure out, like we're all, as we all did, trying to figure out like, who am I, right? What do I believe? How do people perceive me? How do I feel safe in different environments? Um, what person am I wanting to grow into like during this sort of academic journey? And we can see that sometimes there's uh, uh, stereotypes that can be really harmful, right? Especially when you have some marginalized identities. Again, not just thinking about our racial identity, but other aspects of our identity as well, right? So uh, when we think about internalized racism, this can be a result of uh, systemic racism, which I had mentioned earlier, 
Um, but it can also be a way that we try to develop a survival mechanism, right? Um, and try to adapt to what we're experiencing. Um, but when we think about uh, internalized racism as well, sometimes it can be a trauma reaction, right? Where you start to also identify a little bit with sort of some of the oppressive ideas um, that have been harmful and difficult for you to navigate because it's hard to sort of integrate them in, in who you are, right? So even if you look a little bit at the racial identity development model, you'll sort of see this aspect of how you can move from feeling like you have aspects of internalized racism to hopefully moving through um, really starting to take a sense of pride and hope and feel like um, you understand the impact of racism, but you're not internalizing it in the same way as you may have early in your racial identity um, development. Um, we know that experiencing race-related stress doesn't require another person actually being racist towards us, right? So you can experience, again, there's so many messages around us about our identities and how um, other people perceive us, that it's not necessarily that it needs to be a direct uh, interaction, um, but it can be, again, these subtle messages that you may get, um, you know, throughout your life or throughout your day-to-day -day, uh, experiences. Um, when we think about, again, internalized racism, it can include um, sometimes uh, as the person who is holding internalized racist beliefs about yourself, you can actually start to discriminate against people who look like you, right? So you can actually start to not only dislike yourself, but dislike your um, the group that you belong to, right? So in my case, maybe starting to dislike other Black folks or, um, you know, making jokes or sort of thinking about Black folks in a very derogatory manner um, as part of having those, um, you know, um, feelings of internalized racism. So another impact um, that we see um, when it comes to thinking about um, the impact of racism on our students is um, you can see students kind of coming in with a range of concerns. Um, and I know that there are a lot of words on this slide, but I'm gonna try to break down each one a little bit just so that you get a sense of what the example is. So we may see a lot of somatic symptoms, which is sometimes a lot of body aches, back aches, um, chest pains, right? So we may see students actually going to our medical center instead of actually coming to the counseling center because they'll say, you know, I've just had my heart's been racing a lot, right? Or I've had all these migraines all the time, right? And maybe there is a physiological reason for those things, but uh, it could also be psychological distress that's manifesting in somatic symptoms, right? We'll also see that, um, especially after any sort of traumatic incident, um, we may hear students talk about, you know, having difficulty remembering and focusing and feeling this mental fatigue, right? So um, I think specifically after the murder of George Floyd, um, I was hearing across different campuses that students were saying, how do I go back to classes? Like, how do I even focus on classes or think about my academics? Because I feel like my mind is just so scattered, right? I'm not able to really focus and concentrate. And those are some of the things that we would um, continue to see as different incidents are happening um, in terms of any critical incidents. And again, we also know that there's a lot of emotional um, uh, impact, right? So there can be a sense of hypervigilance. So just feeling like you're on edge um, throughout the day, um, a sense of a low self-esteem. Again, some of the emotions we talked about earlier, uh, anger, grief, maybe even just emotional numbing, right? So this uh, sense of feeling a little bit stoic because you're feeling overwhelmed by all of the things that you're feeling. Um, maybe a sense of helplessness, hopelessness, right? Intrusive thoughts, uh, all of those things can Im impact our day-to-day -day experience as well. We also know that some of this stress can also impact our relationships, right? We can start to have a lot of distrust around people around us. Uh, sometimes there may be a desire to only spend time with other black folks or uh, other folks of color. Um, sometimes uh, we'll see students that will start to self-medicate uh, using a lot of different substances, you know, alcohol, marijuana, all of those different things, um, or even just engaging in self-harm as a way of trying to just cope with all of the different emotions that may be coming up. Um, and then of course, just avoidance, right? Um, we'll sometimes see students feeling fearful about going out um, you know, in the city or doing different things, uh, just because again, feeling that sense of a lack of safety and trying to ground yourself in environments that feel safe. But of course this can disrupt functioning, right? So for example, if a student doesn't feel comfortable going to classes, then we know that that's gonna have significant impact on their ability to be successful. And then last but not least, um, we also see that sometimes there can be this disconnection. Um, if you have any sort of spiritual beliefs, uh, sometimes questioning faith in a higher power, right? 
uh, or even just the loss of faith in humanity, right? So some of the things that I'll hear from uh, students is this idea of like, why is God letting you know these bad things happen, right? What does it mean that these things are happening within our community? Um, and sometimes that can be really hard because those answers feel complicated and are not easily um, accessed, right? So even just being part of a faith community can help to start to, to explore some of those uh, thoughts and feelings. All right, so we're gonna pause again for another quick poll. So the question this time is in the past month, what impact has race related stress had on you? So we're gonna talk a little bit about the impact and we're gonna leave this open for again, about a minute. So some of the options are low motivation, low focus and con concentration, sleep disturbance, right? Aches and pains, conflicts in relationships, right? Or maybe just avoiding people altogether. So we'll just pause and see what responses are coming in. All right, it looks like half of the folks, almost half have responded, so we'll wait a little bit longer. All right, so we're at a minute. So in the interest of time, we'll go ahead and close the poll. And it looks like the most common reactions are low motivation and avoidance, right? Um, and it looks like sleep disturbance and eating are also up there. So this is really important, right? So again, if we're thinking about students or even just again, for folks who are not students, if you're having trouble with motivation, that really impacts your functioning because you're not able to do all the tasks you need to do. But then avoiding people, we know that when it comes to mental health, uh, social isolation is uh, really impactful in terms of just your ability to, 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 to do well when it comes to your emotional health, right? So that's pretty significant. Um, we also still see eating and sleeping, right? That's the foundation. If you're not eating and sleeping well, uh, that can also really make it hard to regulate your emotions. Um, so just really important there. And then of course we see uh, about 11% uh, conflicts in relationship and physical aches and pains um, are up there as well. So again, thank you so much for, for completing that poll. Um, oh, sorry. And then of course, some of you had uh, none of the above as well. So there are maybe another range of emotions maybe that we didn't talk about. All right, so we'll go ahead and close that. Um, and then just a couple more points around the, the impact on student concerns. So as I mentioned earlier, there can be a disengagement from uh, the educational environment, um, maybe just having a negative self-concept uh, of just who you are as a student can also be an impact. Um, again, as we mentioned, this idea of having difficulty with social support, uh, maybe a sense of self-doubt, uh, racial battle fatigue, which I had talked about earlier, but I'm going to focus a little bit on the last two points. So. Um, some of the things that you may hear from students or that you may experience as a student is in response to a difficult event, um, you may feel you know, some guilt that maybe you didn't experience the loss in the same way that somebody else did. So feeling a little bit of that uh, survivor's guilt. And then when we think about this idea of dignitary harm, it's uh, this action that somebody may uh, enact on you where you start to sort of uh, feel like your reputation, your honor, um, has been harmed in some way, right? So maybe this can uh, manifest in feelings of humiliation, of shame, right? Um, and that's kind of this idea of dignitary harm. So sometimes feeling, um, as a Black person, almost feeling devalued, right? Not feeling um, seen within, you know, academic environments or in different environments. So that's kind of what we mean when we talk about uh, dignitary harm. Um, this uh, diagram is important in just kind of thinking a little bit about uh, where are students seeking help, right? So we know that many students turn to their friends and uh, parents, but if you look at that number at the beginning, only about 12% actually come to a therapist, right? And I think this is always important because, you know, as a therapist, we're always thinking about, okay, how do we make sure students know that there is support? How do we make sure that they're seeking that support? But a big part of it also highlights the fact that Making sure that students feel supported is a community um, effort, 
right? Because again, it's not just about, you know, siblings or parents or friends. It's also about faculty, it's staff, administrators, right? And which is why all of these three organizations that are putting this program together end up being super important because it really is a team approach. It's a whole community approach. And we all need to be thinking about how do we support our black students at HBCUs because we all need to be involved because again, only 12% are coming to therapists, right? So that can't be the only solution. It really needs to be um, everybody, right? Really engaged and thinking about how do we make sure there's well-rounded support. We know that for some of our students, there's impact of shame and stigma, which can lead to a sense of silence. So again, what are some of the implicit and explicit messages that you may be receiving that are impacting your ability to seek help when it comes to your mental health? So maybe you're aware that you're not doing as well as you need to, but you're really having trouble figuring out how to actually start to ask for help because maybe there's a concern about being labeled as having certain diagnoses. We know that unfortunately in our field, um, sometimes um, black folks can be overrepresented with certain diagnoses, which can make it hard for folks to, to seek help and feel comfortable actually um, you know, getting that help. Or sometimes um, maybe you are wanting to seek help, but you don't have um, therapists or providers that look like you. And that can also be a barrier or people that you feel like understand your experience. And that can also make it hard um, for folks to access mental health services. And then of course, sometimes it's just hard to access mental health services because they can be expensive um, or there's just multiple barriers to, to getting that help. So again, that can make it really, really challenging. So we're gonna transition a little bit to talking about skills and resources before we wrap up. I wanna make sure there's uh, a little bit of time for us to ask um, questions and have a little bit more of a discussion, right? So this is our last poll. Uh, what are some of the ways that you cope with your emotions and race-related stress? So we'll take one last poll and um, let's see if it comes up here. All right, there it is. So polls open. What are some of the ways that you cope with emotions? Let's see if some of the data we have is gonna be confirmed by the audience we have tonight. Can I just say, I'm so appreciative of the level of engagement. I feel like seeing all of you taking uh, these poll questions, I know you're out there even though I can't see you. So it's uh, really, really appreciate the level of engagement. All right, we're gonna leave the poll open for a little while longer. We're at 73%. So we'll see if a couple more people get some responses in before we close the poll. All right. So we'll go ahead and close the poll and let's see what our responses say so far. All right. So yeah, it feels like you are um, in line a little bit with the research. So about 55% said that they talk to friends, about 48% talk to family. And then we also see 48% uh, talk about a religious or spiritual practice, right? So again, we know that that can be an important and helpful tool as well. Um, and then of course we see 50% do therapy, right? So that's great. Um, and of course, uh, talking to faculty and staff. Uh, and maybe for some of you, it's all of the above. Maybe you're trying all of these different things. But again, we're seeing that for many students, turning to, to friends and family is up there, and then a religious practice uh, sort of tied for, for third place in terms of some of those high um, you know, ways that people cope. All right, so I'm gonna share some suggestions here. And then again, we're gonna open up for more of a discussion. So um, some of uh, wonderful psychologists at Boston College have done some wonderful work in um, some of the racial trauma is real uh, work. And uh, there's the link right there. Feel free to even just Google that. But some of the ways that they suggest coping with racial uh, stress and trauma is first to acknowledge the racial stressors, right? So it's kind of thinking about that consciousness raising aspect and really thinking about all aspects of your identity. How do you integrate all the different experiences you have as a black student, um, as you're navigating your different environments, right? Um, as we saw earlier with the poll, uh, continuing to root yourself in any spiritual practice and thinking a lot about that mind-body connection and thinking about how best to honor that for yourself, whatever that looks like for you. So not just tending to the physical aspects of your well-being, whether that's exercise or deep breathing or uh, yoga or any of those things, but also just thinking a lot about um, how are you sort of talking to yourself? Are you being kind to yourself? Are you being compassionate towards yourself? 
as you're experiencing maybe these different stressors that may be hard for you to, to navigate. I cannot stress enough how important it is to, to seek and find people who affirm and validate uh, your experiences, right? So maybe when you're expressing distress that you're not feeling invalidated, that somebody's questioning, well, how do you really know that? You know, are you sure you're not overreacting, right? Sometimes those discussions are helpful to sort of, you know, help you to sort of slow down and pause, but it can also feel really invalidating, especially when you're distressed and you know what you've experienced. So having people who question that can actually be really stressful and aggravating for somebody who's really upset in that moment. And then of course, trying to root yourself in any um, aspects of your uh, cultural identity and your roots. So trying to con contextualize what's happening to you in a historical timeline. So again, thinking about where you are in terms of your experiences and then thinking about some of the things that folks in the past have experienced, right? And then for many students, I know there's so much passion around advocacy and activism, right? So even that is an investment in what the future can look like, right? I wanna share some other um, ideas from other you know, colleagues within our field around radical healing, right? So it's this idea of thinking about how to become uh, whole in the face of identity-based wounds, right? So again, thinking about some of these sustained injuries and how um, as a member of a marginalized or minoritized racial group, um, how you continue to heal. Again, please uh, look up these resources because there's a lot more detail that is available that I'm not gonna go into today. But they also suggest sort of similar themes to um, some of the slides that I was sharing earlier, right? So again, thinking about how do you develop pride in your racial and ethnic identity? And then how do you share your story, right? I think one of the cool things um, about social media is it's allowed an outlet for folks to actually share their story and sometimes find like-minded folks or community within being able to share that story so that you're not only getting support, but you're also having people who you feel like you can trust and they can validate some of the experiences around racism. Um, the third point is just thinking about how do you think about your own resistance um, to some of the you know, forces of oppression, but also thinking about how do you wanna take action? And I think for students, uh, sometimes there can be the sense that action has to look one way or it can only look one way, right? But sometimes even just taking, your, taking care of yourself is an important action, right? Because if you're not feeling good and you're not feeling grounded in who you are, it can actually make it hard to, to engage in activism on behalf of somebody else, right? So sometimes taking action is resting, is sleeping, right? Is making sure you're eating well, is supporting a friend. It doesn't always have to be something that feels um, maybe bigger or uh, require a lot of resources, internal resources in order to do, right? Um, one of the things I love about the, the radical healing uh, article and the work that uh, some of my colleagues have done is just how do you maintain radical hope? Because uh, we all need that, not just from a mental health perspective, it's important to think about how to sustain hope, but also when you think about um, dealing with things that you know we've been dealing for with for, for decades and centuries, right? You need to have this radical hope that things can get better, they can continue to evolve, and they have in some ways, right? But how do you maintain that? Because when you sink into a sense of hopelessness, that can also be hard to, to continue to move forward. And then of course, last but not least, really thinking about self-care, which I'm gonna talk about within this model where uh, the racial recovery plan um, just outlines different steps of things that you can think about. So first reflecting on how you feel, thinking about what your daily upkeep is, right? So not thinking about racial recovery as like, oh, I'll only work on something once I'm reacting to a, a traumatic event, right? Think about how you just continue to take care of yourself day to day, right? How do you continue to, to read about racial identity and race-related race stress? How do you continue to journal, to pray, to just, again, ground yourself in those day-to-day -day things that can actually help um, you take care of yourself? And then, of course, identifying any stressful situation. So, for example, if you're a student, maybe, you know, um, the area that you live in can be pretty difficult to navigate, or maybe you have an advisor or somebody that you feel like tends to microaggress in a way that um, creates stressful situations for you. So how do you continue to, to kind of think about how to take care of yourself, especially when you anticipate that there are these sort of daily stressful situations you're trying to navigate? Um, I think the next point is also a really important one around re recognizing what the early warning signs are. Um, I think this is always so important when it comes to mental health. Don't wait until things are really, really bad or you're having a really tough time. Seek help immediately, right? And the same is true when we're thinking about a racial recovery plan is, how do you know what the early warning signs are? 
I know that for me, when I am waking up earlier than I need to, so if I'm waking up at like 4 or 4.30 and my mind is going, I know that's an early warning sign that something is on my mind and I need to start tending to it as best as I can. Um, then as much as you can, try to come up with a plan, right? Uh, think about, you know, who are your support systems? Uh, what meetings might you go to if you want to engage in activism? Uh, who are the trusted people that you feel comfortable with? Like who's in your tribe? Who are the people that you feel uh, safe with and comfortable with? And then of course, developing a plan for when it's a crisis, right? Who do you call, right? So not all friends or family members are created equal. There's some people where you know that they will listen to you, will, will give you space to talk, will instill hope. And then there are other people who maybe will just pile on, right? And when you're in a crisis, it might be hard for you to, to tolerate someone else piling on and maybe they start telling you about their problems and that may not be the best thing for you at that moment. And then of course, how will you reconnect with yourself after? Um, the crisis has passed, right? What strategies might you use? Um, so again, feel free to explore this resource and just you know write some of these things out for yourself, all right? And then last but not least here, just some quick suggestions on how to support a friend. Um, you know, as much as you can, validate their feelings, appreciate their courage, you know, thank you for sharing this with me if you're in a position where you're supporting a friend. And then of course, I cannot uh, stress this enough, refer them to skills and support, right? You don't have to, meet all your friends' needs, think about how you can get support in meeting those needs um, along with them. All right, so just some quick resources here. Um, the Steve Fund has a crisis text line, um, so a counselor will respond, and this is a counselor that is uh, sensitive to the needs of folks of color. And then these are just uh, some online websites and resources and apps. So if there are any questions, I'll go ahead and pause now. We can take a couple questions before we wrap up for tonight. So I'll leave these on for like two more seconds while maybe folks are taking pictures or just kind of remembering some of these resources, um, but I will open it up. So let me just see if I can find any questions. Uh, and Inosa, if you um, have flagged any questions, please let me know. I'm happy to um, start to answer them. Oh, thank you for adding them to the chat as well. I appreciate that. All right, so I'm just looking to see if we have any questions. Oh, okay. So I see a direct message. Um, so yeah, so I am uh, open to working with folks um, on one-on-one -on -one therapy, and I'm also happy to consult. Um, I'll try to put my, uh, you know, so if you have this accessible, putting my Steve Fund email in the chat. Um, so depending on where you're located, um, I would be happy to, to meet and consult with you if you have any questions about mental health resources, but also if um, I have a, a wonderful group of Black therapist friends. So depending on where you're located, I can also help you get connected to, to some of my colleagues and friends if you're interested in therapy or have questions um, about how to uh, get support. So feel free to email me, happy to answer any questions. Um, but yeah, just feel so grateful. It's actually one of the the best uh, decisions I think I made many years ago without realizing it. I, I absolutely love being uh, a therapist and a psychologist and I feel so honored that I get to work with wonderful organizations uh, such as UNCF and the Steve Fund um, and get to actually just talk about psychology and, and the work that I do. So, um, oh uh, yeah, so I got another question. What is the name of the model you mentioned on aspects of identity slide. So if you uh, Google uh, Dr. Janet Helms, uh, she has uh, racial identity development models and they're awesome. And then there are other uh, psychologists as well who built on that work. Um, so, but if you just do Janet Helms and she has a ton of wonderful books and online resources and things like that. So I think that's what you were referring to earlier. Uh, Sherna, I think is your name. All right, so thank you all so much. I always feel like an hour goes by so fast, um, but I also wanna make sure that you can give us feedback because uh, as you met, as you heard earlier, there's um, more resources and more workshops coming. Uh, so please give us uh, feedback, but thank you again so much for listening. I will turn it over to my wonderful colleague at UNCF, uh, Victoria, just to wrap us up a little bit. Thank you so much, Bhakti. Hello, everyone. My name is Victoria Smith. I am a strategy analyst with UNCS Institute for Capacity Building. Just really quick about the Institute for Capacity Building and uh, what it does within UNCF. 
We partner with historically black colleges and universities um, to support and champion uh, black higher education. We're rooted in the transformative history that HBCUs have and we work towards continuing that legacy. I wanna take the time especially to thank the Steve Fund and Thurgood Marshall, particularly Batsy, Rajay um, as well for working with us uh, so intimately on this particular workshop. And we have upcoming workshops as well, as y'all can see here. Um, next, we have the Reimagining Thriving Communities for Girls and Young Women um, in March for Women's History Month. And also we have, my student is having a mental health crisis, now what? And that is more geared towards faculty and staff to help equip them with the tools to help their students. Um, we also have an upcoming student conference in April, which we are so excited about. So we hope to see everyone that is um, currently on this workshop there. Um, please let your colleagues and peers know um, about this work. I will put um, in the chat the website for our Unapologetically Free initiative where all of this <laughs> wonderful work uh, falls. And I saw in the chat a few times where can they find this um, recording and where will this be housed. This along with our other workshops will be housed on the Unapologetically Free website. I just put it into the chat. Let me make sure it goes to everybody. There we go. So yes, please make sure to um, check the website, uh, follow UNCF ICB as well as the C Fund on social media to get more updates. Oh, also please make sure to take the webinar survey that we have, you scan this QR code. As Batsy mentioned, we really appreciate feedback so we can better serve um, you all. So let's give everybody a minute to scan the QR code. Um, and like I said, it is greatly, greatly appreciated if you take time to take the survey. We appreciate y'all being with us this evening. And um, we hope that you got, well, I hope that you got as much out of it as I did. I love hearing Bati speak. So once again, very grateful for everyone being here this evening. <laughs>